Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then put a finger on Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20. We're asking the question, everybody asks at some point in their life, what happens when you die? What happens when you die? When you die, you know, the interesting thing is when I was writing this message, I just watched the morning news, and the morning news was talking about chat GPT. How many of you have ever used chat GPT? Nobody. All right. All right. One person. One person. You should use it. It is fascinating. It is scary. It is terrifying. It's like a search engine. But it's more conversational. It will do your taxes. It will give you recipes. You can take a picture of your refrigerator, and it will give you all the recipes of the ingredients in your refrigerator. It will, uh, it will write a paper. It, it will talk to you and give you advice. And I thought, well, l- let, me, let me talk with Jet, uh, Chat GPT about the afterlife. I want to see what Chat GPT says about the afterlife. And so I asked the question, Chat GPT, what happens when you die? And this is what Chat GPT said. He said, or she said, I'm not really sure what Chat GPT is, uh, but Chat GPT said, our physical bodies cease to function. Okay, thank you for the obvious. But our spirit and our soul continue into the afterlife. This is a religious artificial intelligence. Depending on one's belief, this afterlife involves a variety of different experiences or realms. Code error is what that is. I don't even know what that... Apparently, whatever you believe will determine, uh, you know, whatever you believe happens in the afterlife will be, be directly linked to what actually happens in the afterlife. I don't really understand what... Uh, chat GPT says but it's interesting but did you realize that most people ask the internet for all of their advice including the afterlife people go to internet people go to books Uh, did you know that there are over 120,000 books related to what happens in the afterlife There are New York Times bestsellers about what happens to people when they die. And a lot of those are written by people who have allegedly died and come back. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to see Jesus and him send me back and then have to write a book about it. I just want to stay with Jesus, all right? People go to books. People go to the Internet. But what does the Bible say about it? What does the Bible say? Not the New York Times bestseller, because I, I could talk about the New York Times bestsellers, all right? I've read some of them, have, haven't read all of them, but I've read enough of them to know this. You ready? That they contradict each other. The people who write about the afterlife, I've got them in my life. You've got them in your library at this church. In fact, I read one, and uh, you, you've probably seen it. it it's, a, it's a book called Heaven is for Real, and it's about a little boy named Colton who sees his younger sister who has died. Well, Colton sees all of these other people in heaven with angel wings, all right? Well, the only problem with that is that Scripture says that when we have a resurrected body, it will be like the body of Christ, and he did not have wings. So that's just one of thousands of examples of why we should base our uh, reality of the afterlife based on the Bible, not off of books. So you ready? The first thing that's going to happen when we die, the very first thing, the first thing that will happen is judgment. Judgment. Look at your neighbor and say, you will be judged. (laughs) Congratulations. You will be judged. Judged. How many of y'all remember, you're old enough to remember, when we did the judgment house at the church? Y'all remember the judgment house? Only three people. 
church. This was like not very long ago. I don't know why y'all decided to make me the devil in the judgment house, but y'all decided to make me the devil. I don't know if that was a hint about something, but we did the judgment house. But the problem is this. Listen, there won't only be one judgment. There will be two judgments. Two judgments. Here's the thing. There's the judgment seat of Christ. That's number one. But number two, there's the great white throne judgment. Those are the two judgments. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to walk through the details of the judgment seat of Christ together. So the judgment seat of Christ, it, it's a judgment that every believer will have to walk through. And the judgment seat of Christ will determine how well you have obeyed Jesus and how well you have served Jesus in this life. In other words, Jesus. Listen, Jesus is going to get out a, a big old hard drive, a, a, a cosmic movie reel of your life. And like a parade from the beginning to the end, Everything will be revealed. Everything you did, everything you didn't do that you should have done. Every thought that you had, every motive, and every intention. Y'all ready for that judgment? Come on. Y'all ready? <laughs> Y'all want to talk about everybody being a sinner, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we, there's going to be some embarrassment at the judgment seat of Christ. I, I can already sense a little bit of it. Everything's going to be revealed. But listen, regrets will be revealed and rewards will be revealed. Actions and inactions. Everything will be revealed. High definition, Dolby digital sound, it's going to be revealed. The judgment seat of Christ. So you're going to have one of two experiences at the judgment seat. You're going to be either really embarrassed or really excited because of regret and reward. Probably a little bit of both. <laughs> I hope there's a lot of excitement. I hope there are a lot of rewards. So this is the judgment seat. And, and Paul, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, he refers to this judgment, and he's comparing this judgment to a refiner's fire that purifies us based on our service on earth. All right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 13. Their work will be shown for what it is. Big parade. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed. How? With fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a what? A reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. Even though only as one escaping through the flames. So needless to say, Paul here is saying how we live on earth follows us into the afterlife. That's what he's saying. The things that we invest in on earth will follow us into the afterlife. How did we as believers live up to God's plan and God's purposes for our life? So in other words, listen. And we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. We're going to be talking about heaven. We're going to be talking about hell. But everybody's experience of heaven will not be exactly the same. Not exactly. Just because you're in heaven doesn't mean we're going to have the exact same experience. That doesn't mean, listen, that our works take us to heaven, but our works do follow us in heaven. That's what Paul is saying here. They don't take us to heaven, but they do follow us in heaven. So Paul is saying that as a believer, if the foundation of your life is wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to burn up 
the judgment's going to burn it all up. But if your foundation is gold, silver, precious stones, it will last forever. That's reward after the judgment. Regret or reward. So three things are going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. Number one, revelation is going to happen. Number two, regret is going to happen. And number three, reward is going to happen. Those are the three things that will happen at the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't know about you, but I think that should inject a healthy sense of fear into our souls to live in such a way that when we see Christ at, at, at the judgment seat, that he offers reward to us. That's the judgment seat of Christ. So um, that's the judgment seat. Let's talk about the great white throne. Now now flip over to, to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. This is the great white throne text here. And we're going to start here in, uh, in verse 11. And as you're flipping there, um, we will... We will meet Jesus in one of two ways. We'll meet him as our judge or our savior. Scripture says that Jesus is the lion and the lamb. This is the great white throne of judgment. The final judgment. When, when Jesus sets the record straight in what we have done with him. That's the great white throne judgment. I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, just, just works here. I'm talking about what you did with Jesus. He separates the sheep from the goats at the great white throne. I'm not talking about the greatest of all time. I'm talking about those who are believers and those who are not true believers. This is the great white throne judgment. And so scripture says that, that we will meet Jesus in one of two ways. Judge, lamb. Let's, let's read it. Revelation chapter 20. Look at verse number 11. Then I saw a great white throne. <laughs> Good job, theologians. Great white throne judgment. A great white throne and him who was seated on it. This is Jesus. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books, plural, were opened. The books, plural, were opened. So when we see Jesus, he's going to have a stack of books. Y'all know what's in a stack of books? What's in a stack of books? A stack of books is everything you did on earth. When nobody else was looking, they're in the book. I'm going to open the book, a stack of books. Oh, okay. Yeah, December the 20th, 1989. Oh, boy. Let's talk about December 20th, 1989. It's in the books. Let's talk about it. Revelation 1 says that that God's voice is like, uh, it's like a, a waterfall cascading a hundred waterfalls. So imagine a cosmic court case, and we got to defend this. To a God who speaks as though there were a hundred cascading waterfalls. Good luck with your defense. To creator God, who's holy and righteous and just, in light of all that you did in life. There's the books. Stack of books. But then, verse 12 continues, there's another book that's singular. There's a book. It was opened. This is the book of life. So there are a stack of books, and there is one book, the book of life. You see it? This is the book of life. This is a stack of books that depict your life. 
So on one side, stack of books, other side, Lamb's Book of Life, all right? What's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life? What's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life is different than what's recorded in this book. These are your actions. This is Jesus' action. These are your names. The ones who have trusted Christ as your Savior. To be your defense on your behalf as you are standing before God at the great white throne of judgment. I wrote it this way. The Lamb's Book of Life is a book. This is so important. The Lamb's Book of Life is a book that doesn't record what you did, but what Jesus did on your behalf. That's the Lamb's Book of Life. Praise God. Praise God. We don't have to answer to this. We should be in awe. That's worthy to worship. Jesus is pleading our case on our behalf. Because we ain't getting in. We ain't righteous. It ain't going to work. Only Jesus, only his work can get us in. So Jesus' actions get credited to us in the Lamb's book of life. Look at how the verse continues. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So some people will be judged according to what is written in these books, and other people will be judged based on what is written in this one book. Do you see it? This is a judgment on what you did with Jesus and whether or not you allowed Jesus to pay the price and the penalty of your sin. That's the judgment. So the question from the, the judge at the great white throne is this. What's your defense? These books or this book? That's the question. That's the question from the judge. That's the choice that we make. You don't want to be judged by what's in the books. You want to be judged what is in one book. Well, Chad, that doesn't really seem fair. And uh, we talk about hell, I know, in a couple weeks. And I can't imagine God would send somebody to hell. And let me tell you something. God is just. He is righteous. And he's not going to force you to go, to go somewhere that your life has not prepared you for. Your sins send you to hell. God doesn't get a kick out of it. God wants everybody to be saved. He wants everybody to go to heaven. But what separates us from God is what's in the books. It's what's in the books. God is holy. God is just. He cannot allow sin to be in the camp. So what do we do? Jesus pays for our sin. All right? So here's how I imagine it. God is, uh, we're all standing in line, and I, I don't know how long the line is. It feels like it's a long line. I hope it's a long line. I don't know. God, I mean, he's like, Chad, step to the front. How we did it 20 years ago here, anyway. And uh, he's going to say, which is your defense? Are you going to pay for your sin? Or did Jesus pay for your sin? Did you trust in Christ as your Savior? Or are you your Savior? That's the question at judgment. Did Jesus pay for your sins? Or do you want to pay for your sins? You know what the Bible says? That a lot of people are going to get this answer wrong. A lot of people. Because they're confused. Because they think, they think that their, their stack of books is, is a lot less than everybody else's, so God's just going to say, well, you, you just come on in. It's not, it's not how it works. It's not how it works. Jesus is the one way. He is the only 
way. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 7, uh, so at the judgment, I, Lord, Lord, I, did you not see what all I did? I signed up. I went to camp. I got connected. I went to church. And Jesus says, at the great white throne of judgment, depart from me. I never knew you. Never knew you. Because you never knew me. You're trusting in the books, not the book. Look at what the, the text continues to say in verse 13. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and uh, the death and Hades gave up the dead, and were, they were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. So the judge is judging you based on the books. I love what Agent Rogers said. He said, I settled out of court. I like that. I settled out of court. I've given my heart uh, to Jesus, and on the cross, he took my sin and my judgment. And then Paul, verse 14, tells us what happens in our pride when we try to defend our own case in front of holy God. Verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into a lake of fire. The lake of fire is, is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book, of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The summons is delivered. The sentence is determined. And the declaration has been made by the just judge, creator God. So what happens when we die? What happens? It's real simple. A test happens. We're tested. And we, I, I, I just gave you the notes for the test. I not only gave you, the, I gave you what the questions were going to ask during the test. So, so if you're taking notes, you just want to make sure that you pass God's ultimate test. Here are the two questions. Number one, who's going to pay for your sin? That's number one. What, that's, that's what the judge is going to ask. Who's going to pay for your sin? That's the great white throne judgment. And number two, how obedient were you to Jesus? And that's the ultimate test of the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema judgment. And when we get these answers right to these two questions, listen, we will be ready to meet Jesus and be with Jesus for all eternity. Can you pray with me? With heads bowed, with eyes closed. I love what Paul tells us. It's uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. We don't have to answer for what we have done when we place our hope our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord we believe in our heart God raised him from the dead we will be saved and we will have answers to the just judge so today when you stand before God <laughs> are you going to try to defend yourself I hope not, because you can't. But today, you can settle out of court. You can settle outside of court. Heavenly Father, I pray by your goodness and by your grace.